Hello everyone. I haven't made any um, YouTube videos for quite some time. The last stuff I did was when I was working on my Gibson ES345, which came out really nice. I play that guitar every other day and um, it's amazing. Anyway, I decided to make a little uh, quick video here because I usually put up things on Instagram and very quick little clips I got. But I have some somewhat interesting amps to show you. And I decided to make a little bit of a video because they're amps that you don't really get much information about. We all get spoon-fed information online about Fenders and Marshalls and so on. But you won't hear a lot about the Ampeg V4. Yes, you'll see some videos about it online. And there will be some information regarding schematics and servicing and so on. Um, but you don't really get spoon-fed too much. Um, back when I first got an Ampeg V4B, that was my first amp I ever got, first tube amp. And, um, you know, I was 17 years old, where I lived, a little small town, had no one who knew anything about tube electronics. And I had to learn the hard way about how to fix tube amps, um, because there was just no information I had to get online and use what little information there was. And the parts for them were very scarce as well. So I really learned a lot on that first Ampeg that I had. And all these years later, um, I've come across this next um, V4, and that is the version with reverb. There are some other preamp differences, but I'm not going to get into that much. These amps were really built identical between the two models, guitar and bass models, and there are just some parts inside that whether they are excluded or included on a circuit board, that makes the difference between an Ampeg V4 and a V4B. The circuit boards are the same. The transformers are the same. Controls in front, largely the same, but not identical. Right, so what's weird about this, this mark, this shop isn't doing very well. Um, what is to, to beware of with this amp is the high voltage. If you're new to tube amps, I was, but um, if you're new to tube amps, this is not a good start amp. It's complicated and parts are weird. And it's it's complicated. Doing the um the replacement of the electrolytic capacitors is um is weird and um, you, you've got to really know what you're doing. It's not a Luna amp. It's an, what I did was this, just this week, I got all the parts to, um, to do the general servicing of this because even though it doesn't look like much when I got this some years ago, I did fire it up and it worked absolutely perfectly. Um, so really, if I just do routine maintenance on it now, it should be great for the rest of the generation. It had the original tubes and everything in it and it still has the original capacitors. So I'm going to walk you through some of this stuff to do with V4s, right? Um, inside, it's all original, it's unaltered. It has a bad previous electrolytics job, which is common down here where I live. I live in the Caribbean, by the way, if you're wondering what my, my weird voice comes from. Here you can see a whole set of um, small computer type electrolytics, PC type electrolytics, stuck together to replace what would have been one can here before. These are the old Mallory cans that have these nice cardboard insulations because in this set here, usually there's a pair of these, what they're in series and one would actually have about three, almost 300 volts on the outside casing. So these are insulated, right? So what I bought was modern replacements. I didn't actually buy the exact um, replacements for these, which you can get um, these days, but I'm, I've gotten the, the the clamp type ones that will make up the substitution. But um, the beauty of these amps, they are really, really overbuilt. The transformers are ridiculously large. The steel chassis is very heavy and durable. It's usually shock mounted against vibrations in its cabinet. Um, so it's really well built. This is the Ampeg Centers V series. It, the top of, of the line of this model is the SVT, which is the famous bass amp, right? And this is the V4, V4B. 
100 watt versions, but of course they had a whole lineup down to 40 watt versions and so on. Um, what's weird about these amps is the tubes. They use weird tubes, right? Um, they use for power 70 to 27s, which are similar to 6L6s, but the, the pinout is different. So, yes, you can put good 6L6s in here, but they've got to be really good ones. I think that 70, 70 to 27s are rated 35 watts, I'm not sure. 6L6s are usually 20, 25 watts, and some versions are 30 watts. Um, but this is the 70 to 27, which is a good type of 6L6. Um, the, there was a factory upgrade for these amps, which was 65 fifths. And in those, they would say that it was an upgrade. I, I think it was like 120 watts rating for the upgrade, or maybe 130. I'm not sure what it was, but um, it was a factory upgrade, right? If you wanted to put in 6L6s, you can, but they've got to be good ones, right? Um, you can't put in EL34s unless you modify the pins, right? Which is to join pins 1 and 8 together to make EL34s work, right? But when you do that, you cannot use 7-27s anymore. Right. This mod is not compatible with 7027s. Right? No. Okay? So, I wouldn't really recommend this. I've done it. <coughs> but EL34 screen voltage rating is 400 volts. The screen voltage in this amp is about 550 volts. It's written on the schematic here. It says 535 volts. So that's so high above EL34 screen rating that we can't really consider EL34 as a viable option. So consider these, the, um, the tubes that will work. There are also weird preamp tubes. There's 12VX7s. All right, this here is just a bit easier. 12. A U sevens, twelve D W sevens, six K eleven. Ever heard of that? No. Nope. And then six A N eight A. Oh no, this one has a six C G seven. Some of them have this. This is for the. Later 70s distortion models got a distortion all the way from, but most of them definitely have these. Okay, this is a regular um, high gain tube you see in Fenders and Marshalls. Every music store has them. 12 AU7, lower gain version of this. Maybe most music stores might have them. 12 DU W7, you won't see this in a music store, right? This tube only really exists in the modern market because Ampeg SVTs use them. And so you, you gotta keep that going, right? Now 12 DW, DW7, as you know, 12 X7 is, or any of these, is two gain stages. This is, one stage is like this, and one stage is like that, right? So it's a mixture of the two. And they don't use these in the modern ratios. 6K11 is a triple stage version of a 12x7. Why Ampeg bothered to put it in this amp? I don't know. This is to drive the reverb. Again, why they didn't do like a regular Fender style transformer couple thing? I don't know. Ampeg just likes to use weird tubes, right? But the truth is that you can get your hand on all of these. These are a bit harder. And you can get all of these. These are all in modern production, right? Right. Power transformer. Very, very big different footprint to fenders and so on. It's much wider. Output transformer on the opposite side, right? 
Here's a back, there's a PC, PCB that all of the, um, the control parts are mounted to. So this is hard to get to. It's not too hard to squirt cleaner fluids in here. That's not too hard. And then up here, very, very complicated switches that are used for bright switches and deep switches and mid shifts, right? Because this, this amp has a really fantastic preamp, very, very um, broad band and um, very, very versatile, flexible mid control. It uses an inductor, which has a huge effect on the mids. Sweeping the mids here, right? Boosting mids and rocking the switch back and forth um, is like kind of like sweeping a wah pedal. Here is the main circuit board. There's also a plate below that's accessible from underneath the chassis so that you can solve off at the top here and remove con components out the bottom of the chassis. So you never have to remove this, this PCB to do any work, which is fantastic. Um, I think we all know if you've ever worked on any amps, I mean, fenders and stuff are easy, um, but there, there's amps like Mesa Boogie and modern amps, which are, you have to, lift the board up to do any work on it. Even 70s marshals can be a pain in the ass, right? This board has a bit of the preamp circuit on it, but it's also got the reverb on these two. Here is a multi-section capacitor, which deals mostly with the preamp. Here's another one. This was the one that was removed and replaced with that mess. Here is another main one. This is one that's in series with the main one. Here are the power tube sockets, all individually hand-wired. Hum balance control. Okay, a little more of our walkthrough. Let's look at the back panel. Here, the first thing you see, which most importantly to be aware of, is the, um, the speaker selector. It's a very crappy looking switch. It's a very small recess. Oh, I wish I could put the flash on. Switch that you kind of have to stick ahead of a, a screwdriver in to move it, or you could, you could do it with your fingers. Um, but it just doesn't really feel very secure. It's kind of like a Fender amp bright switch. You know, I just don't like the idea of all of this power passing through those little contacts. You know, it call me crazy, but it worries me. Right. This, it, the two um, speaker jacks, you would plug into this usually. And if you had a secondary cabinet, then you use this. It won't plug right into this. This is a foot switch for the reverb. The reverb pan lives in the top here, which is this panel right here. And there's something of a lock to stop the reverb springs from flopping around when you're transporting it. This is why this is labeled here, reverb lock. Okay, next is a, a early form of a effects loop, right? And you could use it, as people do with effects loops, as a preamp out or power amp in if you were doing that. And then the other stuff is pretty straightforward. Power cable, fuse, and extension amp. I'll put in a nice little thing to wrap your, um, your power cord around, right? Okay, so I kind of said earlier I wouldn't talk to you about the capacitors, but I really should. It's pointless to leave you hanging. So I'm going to tell you what goes on. Okay, what goes on? is that for starters they use multi-section cans that have different values they're double cans kind of like this right but you see how this says 100 100 there you go 100 100 these ones are actually 40 100 earlier models have 40 70 which gets weird because what happens is that there are two sections being filtered here, which are this, the screens and the power tube plates. You can see it here on the schematic, but I'm sorry, the schematic is very rusty and roughed up, right? So, there's my little pointer. Right, so this is one can, that's another can. So check what happens. On one can, we use one section, which is the 100, you can read it there. And then this, a whole other can is parallel to itself, right? 140, to give 140, in series with this 100 here. That's the plates. On the first can I mentioned, the second section, which is a 40, is then put in series with another 40 capacitor. So this is a screen filtering that I, I 
running along here. And in this case, that's this. This in series with one of those can sections. The first thing I describe, which is the power, the power tube plate things, which is a double section in series with a single section, is this can parallel to itself run in series with one of those sections. As you can see, you can see like a crust. You can see the evidence of this capacitor being bad. I mentioned earlier that I have fired this up and used it. Now I'm wondering how because it looks terrible. Over to this section now. This is the other can that needs to be replaced. This one has all has three 40 microfarad sections and is represented on the schematic. Sorry, I don't have a better schematic, but I didn't print one out. It's these three sections here. One, two, three. Well, CDE, right? And CDE filters reverb circuit and then um, like phase inverter and preamp, right? So all those are on here. Three section. It's kind of hard to get a three section can these days, but the fact is they do make these cans again. CE manufacturing. I'm going to give them a bit of a plug because they've done a good job about that. Um, this, this brand here. Yeah, CE manufacturing has these weird cans with all the different values and many sections in them. So if you wanted to, if you looked at this brand, you could get exact parts to go in here. But I didn't do that because I was pinching pennies. And I bought other brands, JJ in this case, where I'm sort of juggling the sections around to effectively do this. But I've got to sort of rearrange the cans to, um, to make that happen. But it's not, it's not complicated. I'm not bastardizing the amp. I'm just working with what is on the market, right? Now, what else needs to be changed in this amp? You're gonna see something weird here. There's a string of diodes. What the hell are these? They look like a rectifier, but they're not. The rectifier are below this board here, right? I'm not sure what this is, by the way. These, I'm sure this amp has a couple little maintenance mods over the years, so let's ignore these, um, this thing here. Okay, so this is actually a flyback feature which protects the output transformer. I'm not really sure how it works, to be honest. This particular flyback thing, if it's, it's when, um, it's on the schematic here. D78, D9 and D10, right? So that's not the rectifier tube. You won't really see this in any other amps. I'm sure some other amps somewhere have it, but you won't see it in Marshall and Fenders, let's put it that way. Okay, so the parts that I would change in this are below. I should have taken the, the, um, the plate off below to show you, but I don't have to. I would routinely replace the bias electrolytics as well, which are marked on this schematic here as C23 and C15, I think. And I'm going to put R49, I'm going to replace, that's a 75K resistor. I'm going to replace that with a 47K resistor in line with a 50K pot. And I'm going to mount that inside. And that's going to allow me to, to have variable bias, right? The other part that I would change just as a matter of routine maintenance would be the screen resistors, which are R4142. Are Forty-seven, forty-eight, which is this set here, and underneath there are ceramic um, cement resistors like this, and in this amp there are four seventy ohms. But for general use with all of the above tubes there, I would change these to one k five watt, and in fact I've even gone higher on than that. I think I've gone as high as two k in the past, just to have screen current limiting, and. Um, say for overall operation for the screens because the, the voltage on this is very high on the screens and um, besides that there are just about four or five small electrolytic capacitors under this board and under this board which I will change which are these these small types low low wattage types low voltage types and that's actually it after I do that is when I would then fire the amp up without the tubes, then with the tubes, check all the voltages, and then um, that would actually be the, the complete routine maintenance. That, that's all that's necessary, right? Um, because as I said, this did work before, and I do have the correct tubes. 
So that is as much of a walkthrough as I can give you. I don't really think it makes sense to sit here and go through all this soldering with you. It's kind of a waste of time. Um, but they're pretty complex amps. If you ever had to do deep work with these and had to move parts around and do substitution of parts, which I had did in my younger, dumber years with another amp, um, you could get very complicated. If you ever had to swap out power transformers or anything. There's one more tip I'm gonna give you. I've never read about this anywhere and I've never seen anyone complain about this problem. I'm gonna give you a tip that's, you're never gonna hear about it except for this video, okay? This is an exclusive. On my, la my other amp, which is a V4B, okay? Very often, I used to get what I call subsonic oscillations. That is to say, sometimes I was playing and suddenly the speakers would start to stop making sound and they would start to move in and out like that. Boom, 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 boom. In fact, they wouldn't even make noise. They were moving so slowly, they wouldn't make noise. And it was never seen that happen in another amp. I've never read about it anywhere. And um, it's all I could do is describe it as a subsonic oscillation. I've never gotten advice on how to solve it, except I solved it on my own recently. I figured out, or I tried, on any amp, when you're designing amps, you will be told, or you will realize at some point, that the there are resistors on the screen grid, um, control grid resistors, control grid stoppers, right? On a Fender, they're 1.5K, and they're mounted right at the socket. In Marshalls, I'm not sure where they're mounted. Sometimes they don't have them. In this amp, they are 47K resistors right and these are the control grid stoppers right now usually on amps to stop oscillations and so on they're mounted right on the sockets you usually see those right here you would see usually a screen resistor jumping from one pin to the next and then you would see the control grid stopper jumping from one set of pins to the next right on this amp they're not on these, these sockets they're over on the board now, to me, that subsonic oscillation, which I've never experienced or read about in any other way, um, just I just could not solve it. I tried everything, changing tubes, preamp tubes, swapping different capacitors, just everything you can think of, right? What I tried eventually was I moved the grid stopper resistors, which are R37, 36, 37, 43, 44. 36, 37, 43, and 44, and that's here, right? So below here are these 47K um, grid stoppers. I took them out of there, of here, wired jumpers across here, and I took the same resistors and I relocated them to the sockets. And I mounted them on the sockets as an old fender would be. And that solved the problem, right? So if you ever have a weird, uncurable subsonic oscillation or any other type of oscillation that you track to the power tubes, move these from here to the sockets, right? And that's something I, I don't know. I mean, it's not rocket science. Good techs would know that. But for me, in my learning process, I never came across that information and I figured it out on my own. I'm gonna show you all the little mods and um, routine maintenance that I did to it since that last little clip, all right? Because I've been working on it for a few hours. I've cleaned the front a bit. I mean, it doesn't look great, but that, that is as clean as it's gonna get. Um, right, so we did the main thing, which is the capacitor replacement, right? And as I described before, you're gonna see it a little more clearly now. Um, let's use this. Um, amp is unplugged and unpowered. I haven't, I haven't turned it on yet, right? These are the reverb cables, which are just in the way a little bit right now. Right, so what I did was, this is a double hundred can. This is a double hundred can. This is a single hundred um, axial. Right, so what I've done is on this can, this one gets the, um, the ground at the bottom. 
and I took one section, one of the hundred sections, and put that in series with these two hundred sections. And that's not an and that's not an even distribution of the capacitance, but that's pretty much how they have it in the originals, except that they had a forty hundred in series with a hundred. So adding the extra capacitance, hundred and hundred, is is an I would say it's an improvement. Um, I mean we're dealing with a clean amp here. There's no real such thing as too much capacitance in this thing, you know. Right. And on the first can, the second hundred stage is now in series with this other hundred can. So that's the screen filtering. So we've gone from a 40 here and a 40 there, which should have effectively given you 20 microfarads of capacitance. It's now 100 and 100, and that gives you 50 of capacitance, which is good for the screens, you know, keep that voltage nice and tight. Right, back up to the rest of it, which is this big four section can. It's 40 and then three twenties. And I only needed three sections, so I doubled up a few. One is for the phase inverter. One is for the reverb. One runs the whole preamp. And that replaced the earlier triple section can that I had before. Okay. On the other side, I changed all the other electrolytics, which are just these four caps, this, 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 and, um, and this down here. And they're all the same value, 10, um, 10 microfarad at a lower voltage. And that is it for electrolytics. Oh, I also did the bias ones. So the bias of these two here. Also 10 uh, microfarad at a, it's 100 volts, but this one, these don't happen to be 160s. I changed, okay, on, that's it for capacitors. That was the capacitor job. 200 cans and a triple section, or in this case, four section, but doubled up. Um, multi-can. That's it for capacitors. Okay. Next thing is resistors. We had some power resistors. We had 470, 2 watts. 470, 2 watts for the screen um, resistors. I changed those to 1K, 5 watt, which is a general good practice for these, right? We also had two kind of burnt out looking, um, or one, one the, you would have seen in my last earlier video, they had some um, resistors tacked on here and tacked on here and what those were is that the last technician or the last person to come in here rather burnt up one of these traces which as you can see I've replaced with a bit of a jumper wire right so that is repairing previous bad work and the resistors that were attached to that I replaced and they were effectively a 3k resistor here I've, I've put together two other ones here and a 4, 7, 10, 10. this is the one that goes to the screens right this goes, these, uh, this, and um, another one up here, uh, the voltage um, droppers between these, these sections here. Okay, I also did a few other resistor changes. Um, in this amp, I told you earlier about the, um, the power tube control grid stoppers they were here and I replaced them with some jumpers and I relocated those resistors onto the sockets themselves with some heat shrink and so on so the oscillation risk that I experienced with my other V4B would be eliminated by that move the last thing is normally you know these days you'd put some one ohm resistors at the cathodes of the power tubes to measure bias current and bias voltage drop. On these amps, they actually had plate resistors, which were 3.6 um, cement type resistors. Why they're 3.6, I don't know, but I know why they're there. They act, these, these type of, of um, resistors blow in the case of a huge spike or um, current pull. And they would effectively take out the um, the that tube out of the circuit and sort of act like a fuse, but they were all drifting in value and so on. So I just replaced them with one um, ohm half watt resistors, which is what I would have used on the cathodes. And so I'll be measuring my bias current from the voltage drop on these rather than setting it up at the cathode. So I could have just jumped these 
and put these at the cathode, but to do that wiring would have been a real hassle. The wiring here, the way that the, um, the wires on these sockets are laced together would have been a real hassle to put individual one ohm resistors to ground on each one. So I didn't bother. Other than that, I just, you know, replaced the power cord, put on a nice cord with a, a weatherproof thing here. Um, I'm about to go clean the sockets with some Pro Gold. I cleaned the pots already and the switches in the front. And that's about it. So those little mods I showed you are the bulk of what I would do to a V-series, you know, as, as I say, slight mods and routine maintenance. There's one thing I forgot to say. Here um, are 52, or, no, R49, which is here. There's a 75K resistor. And I took that out and I've replaced it with a 47K in series with a 50K pot. So this now has a variance of between 50K and 100K, which is a great range um, to replace a 75K resistor. And that should give me um, all the tweaking I need for biasing the tubes to a, a nice, safe, but good sounding level. Um, if you are switching between different types of tubes, if you swap, swap doing the EL34 swap, I mentioned earlier, I didn't really, I didn't recommend, but I mentioned it, or you were moving between 7027s and 6L6s or 6550s, this, if it didn't cover the range of, um, to, to bias that tube, you may have to either change the 47K here or change the neighboring, I think it's R50, which is, is nearby. Um, I'm not sure exactly where it is. It might be this one on here, but it's all on the schematic. But that is just my my bias mod with the um, the one ohm plate resistors. Okay, next part of the vid, I've cleaned up all the tube sockets, reinstalled the tubes. They were all the original ones. They all have Magnavox labels on them, so these things are 40 years old. And um, these here, one of these tubes, 7027s, didn't look very good. I have it over here and you can see some evidence of meltdown on the plates on that spot there overheating in that spot there you go again so I subbed it out to another one I had from before so there's a full set of 7027s even though they're all pretty old I have a couple of little meters here one is set up to measure the high voltage one is set up to measure um, the current draw across one of the the last tube on the end there right and I'll, I'll move them along to check the bias so i've let it warm up for a minute or a few minutes really and i'm now going to hit that standby switch for the first time which always makes me very nervous okay it's on plate voltage actually looks a little low that's 32 millivolts so just about 32 milliamps across that Tube, which is not bad for now. So, I mean, it's not going to melt down while we're checking things out. Plate voltage is a bit on the low side. I'm not sure what my line voltage is right now, but um, I guess I could check through and see why that's a little lower than I expect. I expect about 550 there or more. Anyway, that's up and running. Um, Let's see how things go. So that's it for now. I fired this up earlier, and as you saw, I wasn't really happy with the um, the plate voltage. It looked a little lower than I thought. Then right after that, it started to blow the fuses, and I couldn't get it running again. It turns out that it was a little diode was shorted out in the rectifier. Not this. There's eight diodes. Well, actually, there's about ten diodes around here. But one in the main rectifier bridge had shorted, so that was blowing fuses. I've just replaced it. I'm going to go ahead and change all of those diodes, but I don't have enough right now. So I'm able to get it running again, just changing the one that shorted. Okay, so I'm firing up again, and hopefully the plate voltage is a little closer to where I wanted it, and I could go ahead and bias the amp. Right, so one is monitoring plate voltage. 
One is going to mono, one to bleed current. Let's see what happens. I'm hearing sound coming out of the amp. Up to five. Still not happy with that. I still think that's a little low. But I did measure it without the tubes in. And I got about 545. So I'm not sure if, um, if that's really the final correct voltage for this or if something is still a little bit wrong. And the bias current here is pretty good actually. I don't have to change it much from there, but that's just monitoring one tube. I have to move across and, and monitor all before I could settle on it. Okay, so this is a successful firing up. As I say, I know the problem is with some of the diodes, they gets a bit worn out. And I'm gonna change those. So that's the latest update here. And um, I had one little frayed wire inside, one of the little signal wires going from one um, of the preamp boards into the effects loop. The effects loop is pretty much the junction of the preamp and the power amp. So there was a little frayed shielded wire there that was cutting off the signal. And having um, repaired that, everything's up and running. Um, the two input channels here are identical. And I've gone into both and sort of figuring out the. Um, sensitivity settings and a few things I'm not quite familiar with. to do really is um, at some point in the future change the power tubes because they are the old ones. The preamp tubes seem to be fine and um, since one of the many diodes here shorted I'm going to go ahead and change um, change out all of them but I don't think that that needs to be done within this um, video. The fact is we have the um, up and running. So I thought I'd make a little bit of a contribution. Um, thank you, YouTube audience. Until the next time.